Well, welcome to the second part of topic one in the channel hydraulics module. In this part, we're going to look at the energy equation. We're going to derive Chessy's equation for gradually varied flow. Um, we'll talk about the energy coefficient, and then we'll finish off by talking about estimating roughness coefficients, focusing on natural channels. But first, let's talk about the energy equation for gradually varied flow. Now, you probably uh, studied the energy equation uh, for pipe flow in your previous fluid mechanics course. Here we're going to look at um, the uh, apply that energy equation in an open channel. We'll focus on the short length of uh, this, uh, this channel L, um, denoted by the two cross sections in this diagram, uh, 1 and 2, and you can see it's non-uniform and gradually varied because the water surface gradient is not parallel to the bed gradient. Now we're going to sum the energy terms for cross-section 1 and cross-section 2 um, and uh, the difference will be effectively the energy loss over this length L. So let's begin with the potential energy which is equal to the water depth at the two um, cross-sections D1 and T2 plus some height above an arbitrary datum. So the potential energy um, at cross-section 1 is D1 plus Z1 and at um, cross-section 2 it's D2 plus Z2. Next we'll look at the kinetic energy um, at the two cross-sections. So this in, in, um, in terms of head is given by the velocity squared divided by 2 times gravitational uh, acceleration so u1 squared on 2g and u2 squared on 2g. And if we sum these energy terms at the two cross sections, we see they're different, and the reduction in the total between cross section 1 and cross section 2, i.e. the difference in the sum of these energy terms, is the head loss between the two cross sections, and we'll denote that by hf. So now we can construct an energy balance between the two cross sections, which is the sum of the energy terms uh, at both cross sections, u squared on 2g plus d plus z. Um, and in the right hand term in the downstream cross section, we also need to add in the energy loss, so we have an energy balance. Remember, this is based on the principle of the conservation of energy, which we discussed um, in the previous. Uh, uh, in, the, in the introduction to the module. And we can also draw the energy gradient. This is the, um, the line which follows the total um, head at the two cross sections um, and the energy gr gr gradient is denoted by uh, S sub F. So we can see under this situation of gradually varied flow, in fact we have three gradients. We have the bed gradient, we have the water surface gradient, and we have the energy gradient, and all three um, have different values, so none of them are parallel. Now we're going to use uh, this energy equation for gradually varied flow to derive um, Chessy's equation under these conditions. So here it is again, the energy, um, the energy equation. And Chessy assumed that the shear stress acting on the boundary of the channel was proportional to velocity squared, and I've used the, um, the overbar to indicate an average velocity along the length, uh, that short length of channel L. And I've replaced our proportion of constant, um, the uh, constant of proportionality that we used um, in part one with Chessy's coefficient. And this means that the energy loss over that length L is equal to this equation, the distance L divided uh, multiplied by the uh, velocity squared divided by the, the product of Chessy's coefficient squared times r. Substituting into the energy equation, that's this is the energy equation, if we substitute this term for the energy loss over the length uh, into this term and we rearrange, we get this equation here and this second term, this last term in brackets, is in fact the energy gradient. See, we have the difference in the, in the sum of the energies at the two cross sections, and we have the distance between the cross sections. So this is 
the energy gradient, which we denoted by S sub F in the previous, um, in the previous slide. Um, and so we have this equation, and if we take the square root of both sides, we get the Chezy equation, except the gradient is not the bed gradient or water surface gradient in this case, it's the energy gradient, S sub F. So we can see that Chezy's equation does indeed apply under conditions of gradually varied flow, but we must use the energy gradient under these conditions. This doesn't entirely solve our problems because in fact if we go to a river which has got gradually varied flow, we, we don't know the energy gradient. Um, we, we need to measure it or model it in some way and in fact that particular challenge is one that's dealt with in topic three, the final topic of this module, so we'll come back to that problem um, when we look at modeling uh, gradually varied flow conditions. Next I want to talk about velocity distribution. So all through uh, this module we've been talking about the mean cross-sectional velocity. In fact velocity varies across the cross-section. We have very low velocity around the channel boundary and in fact um, under the no-slip no condition it's zero right at the channel boundary increasing um, away from the boundary but possibly reducing a little at the surface as a result of small um, flow resistance between the air and the surface of the water. So we have a slight decline in velocity right at the surface. And so the mean cross-sectional velocity is calculated in this way. It's the product of velocity um, times unit area, um, the, the integral of velocity dA over divided by the total area of the cross-section. Now remember that the kinetic energy term in our energy equation uses u squared, velocity squared, and we've been using the mean velocity squared. But let's stop for a moment and think about that. What if we actually considered individual molecules of water or parcels of water traveling through the reach, that cross-section, and we calculated the kinetic energy for each individual parcel of water? Shouldn't the total um, kinetic energy for the cross-section equal the sum of the kinetic energies for those individual parcel of parcels of water. It's the same energy, it should simply be the sum. However, we've been using u squared um, to, to represent the kinetic energy of the, uh, to calculate the kinetic energy of the cross section, when in fact, when you uh, integrate the, um, the flow weighted velocity squared over the, um, over the cross section, uh, and calculate the mean value, it doesn't equal the mean velocity squared. So we can't use um, velocity squared, or if we do use velocity squared, it's not an accurate um, representation of the, for, the, for calculating the kinetic energy of the cross-section. To overcome this problem, we define an energy coefficient, alpha, which is calculated in this way and we add alpha to our energy equation to correct it for this, uh, for this difficulty. So the alpha term um, it, uh, multiplies the, um, the kinetic energy term which is based on the mean cross-sectional um, velocity. And alpha is generally greater than 1, 1 1.2 or so. Finally I want to talk about estimating the Manning's roughness coefficient, the Manning's n. There's a number of tables available, lookup tables, which give you the Manning's n value for rivers of different or channels of different types. So here we see some typical values uh, in an earthen straight channel, it's 0.02 to 0.025. Um, in a concrete channel, 0.012 to 0.017. And um, we see in a rock channel, it can be up to 0.05. These are reasonably straight um, channels, the values are quite low compared to what you would get in a natural channel. So they're useful if you're working in a, uh, a designed, engineered channel to use these values of Manning N to apply um, the Manning equation. In fact, in natural channels the situation is a little bit more difficult because there's so many factors that contribute to channel roughness. There's vegetation and variability in the channel shape, um, variability in the bed, topography, roughness on the bed, logs in the channel, and so on. 
and there are some books which, books which you can use to to, um, to to estimate what channel roughness coefficients you should use for your river and in fact how they work is they provide photos of a set of rivers which have a range of different roughness characteristics and you choose the one that looks most like your river and then you can transfer that main n value to your river for use in calculating the cross-sectional velocity. And here are two, two such books. One of these was developed for Australia and one, one is from the US. Here's some of the data um, from the Australian example. We can see two river channels, the Acheron River at Taggarty and Merriman's Creek at Stradbroke West. Um, and uh, we see that the Manning's ends are, qu are quite a bit higher than what we saw in the, um, the lookup table before for artificial channels. So for the Acheron River, which actually doesn't have a great deal of vegetation on the riverbanks, um, the Manning's end is still quite high, somewhere between 0.034 to 0.05. In Merriman's Creek, it's quite a bit higher, it's 0.08. And the reason for this is there's a large amount of roughness in, a, in the form of vegetation, both within the channel and on the stream banks, which provide flow resistance. So in this channel, in Merriman's Creek, um, we would see a, a greater depth, all else being equal, than in the Acheron River. Here are two other rivers um, for which we have information on Manning's N. And in this case, we've got quite detailed information on how the Manning's roughness coefficient varies with discharge, because the reality is, in natural channels, Manning's N is not a constant with discharge, which makes things a little bit more difficult for us. In the top figure, we can see that uh, at low flows, which in both figures at low flows, the channel roughness looks pretty similar. It's a sort of a coarse bared river. As flow increases in the in the bottom e image, it inundates uh, you know, a grassy, a vegetated bank. And in the top image, as flow increases, it will uh, interact with the vegetation which overhangs the river. So in fact, what happens in the top um, uh, image, the, the river in the top image, is that we would expect the roughness coefficient may in fact increase as the stage increases. Whereas in the bottom um, picture, we might expect that it would um, remain the same or perhaps decrease. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. This is Manning's N as a function of discharge plotted on um, a linear log plot, and it increases with discharge and in this bottom picture, we see that Manning's N decreases um, for lower discharges um, and then stabilizes for higher discharges. Well, that's all for part two of these videos for topic one. There is actually one more extra video if you're interested um, in watching as well. Um, that's uh, listed as the extra. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks for listening.